Good uh, afternoon, uh, good evening if, if you're west of us, and uh, good morning uh, for the, uh, oh, I guess east of us for good evening, and good morning if you're, you're west of us uh, in the US, Canada, Mexico, and uh, South America. Uh, so we'll get started now. So thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Kevin Richmond. I'm joined by Jamie Berryhill and Daniel Tostada from the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation. Um, and we want to welcome you all to the webinar on public sector trends around uh, innovation. So uh, Jamie will introduce the topic uh, in a second, but I just wanted to quickly go through good housekeeping. Uh, so uh, I had mentioned before we have everyone muted, but I've been on enough webinars to know that, oh, thank you, Daniel, <laughs> that uh, webinars don't always go as planned in terms of audio, so uh, please everyone be conscientious and mute your phones. Uh, we also have uh, someone on the other side that is not into this picture right now looking at chat as well. So if anyone has any questions, comments, um, audio issues, technical issues, please let us know and, and type those in there and he can respond and um, stop us if there's a question for us to answer. Um, and we, we really encourage this. We, we schedule time for there to be questions, so we're not talking the entire time. Um, also, just a reminder that uh, everyone has different experiences. We talk about innovation a lot as it's contextual and it, it's got to be new to your context. So therefore, we have a very diverse mix of knowledge and context. And so everyone can bring value to this. So there are no stupid questions there are no bad questions there uh we want to hear from other people and their experiences and and their reactions to uh what we have developed um and then lastly have some fun i know webinars uh sometimes can be a bit dry we will try to make them at least a, a little bit fun and and make some bad jokes that hopefully you can enjoy or or not enjoy uh, but overall uh, we're trying to make it a little more upbeat a little more energetic um so with that i will pass it over to Jamie, um, who can really talk about uh, the, the innovation trends and really kick off the subject. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everybody. This is Jamie Berryhill at the OECD Observatory. Uh, and uh, I'll just walk you through quickly uh, uh, just a little bit about what OPSI is in case you're um, new to our material. And then we have a couple other folks on the line and we'll kind of introduce as we go. Um, I tend to focus on the areas in the observatory that are um, related to tracking the Global Trends uh, Project. Uh, but then also things there where public sector innovation intersects with digital government as well. Um, and just a bit on the observatory, uh, we, we have a bit of a three-pronged mission. Uh, and one is to provide trusted advice to governments on, uh, on achieving public sector innovation or working towards innovating and doing things in different ways. Um, some of the examples of this is where we work directly one-on-one -on -one with a country like we have with Canada or Brazil to do uh, reviews of their public sector innovation systems. Um, we also do smaller projects and workshops uh, on a country-specific basis, providing them advice and, and kind of consulting on how to, how to do things a little bit differently. Um, the second pillar to our mission is to uncover what's next. And, and we're on a webinar right now that's the, kind of the, um, the basis of all of that work where we're tracking global trends, servicing what's next, trying to understand what tomorrow will look like so we can take actions today. And then finally, uh, the third pillar is turning the new into normal, where we provide a lot of tools and resources and frameworks for governments and people in governmental partners as well to help um, try to embed innovation as a, as a daily part of life instead of just kind of every now and again, thinking through uh, uh, an innovation exercise or, or doing it in an ad hoc way. Uh, so, uh, that's a bit about OPSI, and within we're within the OECD, and if you're less familiar with that, it's a, a, a large uh, or smaller than uh, other international organizations, but it's a large international organization of about 3,000 people uh, based in Paris, and uh, we're a 36 member governments, and we all collectively work together on basically different projects related to every aspect of the way uh, governments work. Uh, OPSI is a team of about 10 people within that larger framework. Uh, and, and for this particular project, uh, and, and a lot of work on tracking global trends, OPSI works with uh, a, a partner organization called the Mohammed bin Rashid Center for Government Innovation based in the UAE. And with that, I want to pass it over to our partner and colleague, uh, Nora, who will be able to introduce herself and tell you a little bit about her organization. Nora? 
Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Noura Rabi Kazan. I'm part of the Mohammed Zalachi Center for Government Innovation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar with uh, everyone and to discuss the Global Funds Report, uh, as well as the Edge of Government um, Experience, part, which is part of the World Government Summit. Uh, just a quick brief about the center. We're um, incubated within the Prime Minister Office of the United Arab Emirates, and our main mandate is to uh, stimulate and enrich the culture of innovation within the government sector and the UAE. Um, and not just that, through experiences like the Edge of Government, which we will explain later on in this webinar, we, um, we do um, check in around the world with the support of the OECD and the OPSI team to see what uh, other uh, governments are being innovative in. And we uh, bring those um, projects and showcase them in a very interactive uh, way in the um, World Government Summit. Great. Thank you, Nora. And then, so the, the way that this, uh, the rest of the session will go is that I'll walk you through some of the trends that we're seeing and Kevin will walk you through some of the trends as well. We have my colleague Daniel here who will walk you through some of the sample case studies that we've featured. Uh, and Nora can talk to you a bit about how this all culminates in, in a uh, uh, large experiential event every February at the World Government Summit called the Edge of Government. And then we'll open it up to some questions. And also uh, something to keep in mind throughout this is we would love to hear people's thoughts uh, through the chat uh, and people's questions about what do you see next? What This is our third year tracking global trends. We'd really like to know um, what some of the trends you see on the horizon are, and it would be really useful to help us uh, inform our future work. Um, I don't know if there's a way to unmute you necessarily, so you might have to use the chat box there, but if you if you have any ideas that, are, uh, uh, that you get during the course of this conversation or things that you think the future uh, will be shaping up the future, please do let us know and we'll, we'll certainly consider those. Uh, so starting just with our trends work, uh, just we'll give you a brief overview and you can access our report in a digital story on a report that summarizes key themes at trends.oecd-opsi.org. Um, but we covered three main trends uh, in this report and our work, is, the methodology for our work is we do a large call for innovations crowdsourcing exercise each year. Each year gets bigger than the last um, and combine that with uh, really in-depth research that we do uh, with uh, the team and I here at the OECD, uh, where for this past year we surfaced 552 uh, innovations from 84 different countries that we spent several months uh, uh, analyzing and, and, uh, and, uh, and oftentimes visiting and meeting with individuals to speak about their work to surface what we think the key trends in public sector innovation are right now. Um, and uh, our, 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 we really have several goals with that. And one is to surface new ideas and approaches, let us see what and prepare for what's next, uh, facilitate building a network of innovators. We, we do a lot of connecting and convening of the innovators behind uh, the cases that we see, uh, working to embed and duplicate success and reduce the impact of failure and to also speed up the process of innovation as people learn from each other and see what else is going on. They're not reinventing the wheel. They're, they're, they're leveraging each other's work, um, stealing in all the right ways. Uh, so, and we really promote that kind of uh, that activity. And from the three trends that we've covered uh, in this year's report, um, one of them uh, is we, we refer to as vis invisible to visible. And each one of these trends is actually a bit of a, a bundle of sub trends that we're seeing with similar intentions and similar motives behind them. And so when it comes to uh, invisible to visible, uh, what we're seeing in terms of these bundles of sub trends is uh, in many ways a real maturity on things that have been happening for a few years already. Uh, a key example here is we're seeing a lot of growth in behavioral insights, uh, activities going on in governments, which isn't entirely new, but also it, it, but it's being applied in new ways. And then the other end is, is a lot of new applications of gamification. Uh, and then most innovatively, the merger of these two types of things. So in terms of BI, uh, or behavioral insights, which are in many countries also called nudges, uh, which governments are using to understand uh, human made motivations and nudge them towards things like paying their taxes on time, contributing more to re retirement accounts. Um, we've seen that government related uh, behavioral insights units have swelled to over 200 uh, different organizations across governments in the last couple of years. And then with gamification, we're seeing a move past what we called kind of post-it based workshops, where I think all of us on the line, anybody who's involved in innovation has probably been in dozens of workshops where you go in and you talk about ideas and then there's post-its and you're adding these post-its to the wall and there's theory, like themes at the end and that's all great. 
but we're also seeing maybe an emergence of new trends beyond that where a lot of governments and a lot of innovation organizations are coming up with serious games or different kind of other gamification methods that are maybe uh, innovating on previous work and, and trying to move past some of the workshop fatigue that we've been seeing going on in uh, innovation organizations. Um, an example of this is, uh, is maybe a European Commission scenario exploration system that helps users de develop any t different types of future journeys and scenarios and role playing. Um, and we've actually surfaced a couple dozen of these types of games and we have them all available for you on an online platform that we built out over the last year called the Opsi Toolkit Navigator, which you can navigate those types of games in many different toolkits on our website. Uh, there's a, it, we wrote about a case here called Carrot Rewards, which Daniel will talk about in a little bit that kind of gets at this key point of how you combine behavioral insights and gamification. The sub another subtrend under the invisible to visible that we're seeing is uh, an uptake in immersive technologies. Uh, things like augmented reality and virtual reality have really gotten um, much less expensive in the last few years. And we're seeing governments react to that uh, opportunity with coming up with new and immersive ways using technology to bring in voices and to, see, uh, and to see things that they hadn't previously seen by involving people that had not typically been involved in uh, political processes and providing their comments and thoughts to governments. Uh, and many of those are shaping up around augmented and VR. Uh, so uh, for the most part, we're seeing these at the local government level. Uh, as a way to really engage with people in new ways and often people who haven't been heard from before. Uh, we cover a case study in our report called Finding Places where the, an MIT lab is working with the government in Hamburg, Germany uh, to use augmented reality and, and demonstration boards with Lego blocks to allow citizens to physically like build um, potential uh, refugee location sites in their own communities with Legos to symbolize different types of buildings and different types of uh, accommodations for folks. So you get you bring together the community and the and the the recipients of uh, of these innovations together to try to figure out to collectively using immersive technologies uh, optimal solutions for folks. Uh, also invisible to visible, we're seeing a maturity in citizen science. Uh, efforts where governments are using the collective power of citizens to help make observations and tackle uh, scientific challenges together. And we've seen citizen science, and we've written about citizen science a few times over the last few years, but are seeing a great maturity in this model uh, with really systemic use and thousands of people participating. And a fantastic example of that in our report is called Zika Mozzie Seeker where Queensland, Australia has activated thousands of citizen scientists to deploy traps around the, around the region to uh, catch sample mosquitoes, uh, to send these into DNA labs for testing, uh, to alert local authorities if there's any types of mosquitoes capable of carrying the Zika virus in the area so they can uh, build in uh, reactive responses and, and, uh, and uh, safety measures to ensure that areas where those things are detected are, are not allowed to spread. And one final one we're seeing on here, which I think is one of the more interesting ones that we don't have a specific case study in our report this year, but we're looking at more and more, uh, is called positive deviance. So governments taking action to study a, what are positive outliers uh, in, in society to figure out if those things that have allowed these positive outliers to succeed uh, can be more broadly generalizable to the rest of society. Some examples we talk about in the report are um, uh, the United Nations uh, uh, development program work in, uh, in, in Pakistan to study uh, uh, young women uh, who have been able to uh, achieve uh, different levels of career success in ways that in, in certain parts of the country were, were really difficult uh, in, uh, for, for women to achieve. And they're working with these uh, successful outliers to study what exactly makes them different and what can be done to replicate these successes in others. Um, so these four sub trends really bundle up into taking invisible insights from the past, invisible outliers in the past, and making these things visible uh, to greater effect, uh, often using technology. Uh, and Daniel talked to you quickly about a case that we featured here called Carrot Rewards. Thank you, Jamie. Um, yeah, so the uh, winner for this year's um, Edge of Government Award was Carrot Re Rewards. Um, so what is it? It's a uh, Canada's uh, national wellness and it's a national wellness rewards platform. Um, what's unique about it is that it combines, is an application that combines gamification and behavioral insights to allow governments to understand better 
what are the motivations and the perspectives of the constituents. So the problem that they were trying to solve is that healthcare costs in Canada were on the rise at an unsustainable rate. And they were interested in the wellness and the well-being of Canadian citizens because that would not only keep healthcare costs down, but make citizens be healthier. So um, the government of Canada launched a partnership um, with Carrot Insights to develop the Carrot Rewards app. Um, what's fun about it is that the users can gain points for the different healthy behaviors that they engage in, such as um, you know setting walking goals and then meeting those walking goals. Um, they can complete you know, surveys and quizzes. And what do the once they gain those points, what they can use them for is um, a particularity to Canada, which is uh, wellness program. Uh, sorry, loyalty programs. So in Canada, about ninety percent of Canadians are subscribed to a loyalty program. Um, and an average household has 13 different memberships, which as an American is very striking because I don't think that I, I have any, I think my mom's subscribed to Macy's, that's about it. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's 57% of Americans have some kind of well uh, loyalty program participation, whereas it's 90% in Canada. So this was really well tailored to the Canadian market. And uh, the users, once they gain those points, they are able to participate in those loyalty programs and, and gain different rewards like flights or gift cards. Um, so it is really blossom in popularity. Um, and what's, what's great about it is the fact that it's also been able to collaborate with different uh, health campaigns within Canada. So uh, CARE partnered with the flu campaign, you know, the annual uh, pushing people to take their flu shots. Um, through the app, they were getting push notifications to remind them uh, to get their shot. They were taking geo uh, localization quizzes to figure out where is their nearest pharmacy. Um, and due to this campaign, 30,000 people were, took the flu, which should hopefully make Canada safer and healthier. Thank you, Daniel. And, and just as a reminder, you can always drop questions into the chat box as we go, and we'll either address those as, uh, as we go, or we'll, we'll hold some time at the end for Q&A and also to get your thoughts on what trends you're seeing. Um, but with that one, I'd like to pass it to Kevin, who's going to give you a bit of an overview about uh, our second trend. Sure. Thanks, Jamie. <clears throat> so the second trend was around opening doors. And so what we mean by that is complexity has made it increasingly more difficult for governments or for, for citizens to both participate in government as well as to actually gain a lot of the benefits uh, that government provides. And so what, I, what we mean by that is, is in like the social welfare space where there are certain programs uh, that are created that people don't know how to access, don't even know exist. So this is really around what governments are doing to open doors for at-risk population, uh, for, for people that are trying to do social good in uh, the, the countries, um, and really those, those underserved populations and trying to make things more accessible for them. And so within that, uh, there were some really interesting cases uh, that really took a new spin on, on some pieces that uh, governments have have not really done before. So one of my my favorite uh, that I know Daniel is going to be talking about a little more um, is around currency and new currency. And so when we say new currency, we don't mean Bitcoin. Uh, that is a, a separate topic. Uh, we specifically mean that there are things that are available for currency, including how the government interacts with citizens, that doesn't necessarily have to be money or monetary but common goods that people have that they can exchange for social rewards or social welfare. Um, and what we're seeing this more and more connected to, which is the, the really interesting trend, is that it's starting to be connected to sustainability. So as climate and as sustainability and environmental uh, factors continue to be greater and greater in terms of the, the efforts that are being done by the government, awareness by people and demand for people for, for more sustainable products, you're seeing gov government starting to uh, react in a way that can combine some of these. So in essence, it's trying to use sustainability, Your call has been put on hold by the other party. Please. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so we're, we're starting to see the look of uh, combining these, these uh, uh, sustainability efforts and really that idea of the circular economy where, where you are 
um, looking at a product from make all the way to, to finish and how it can be continuously reused um, as an economic catalyst. And so uh, again, we have a, a couple really interesting cases there and Daniel will talk about that one a little more in depth. Um, another one that's been talked about a lot, but we're finally starting to see happen in reality is the platform economy. So we know the platform economy already. Every single person uh, on this call probably has some sort of platform app that they use, whether it be Airbnb, Uber, et cetera, uh, for, for taxis, living. Um, but there's, there's so many as a service platform apps that are out there now. Um, so as that has become more and more of the norm in our private lives, the theory of it in our public lives as the, the government can be a platform for things um, is moving more and more into reality. So the really interesting example here was a, a test pilot in Amsterdam where they said, how many government buildings go underutilized in the evenings, on the weekends, um, as governments shrink and grow, there are spaces available, there's meeting rooms that go underutilized. How can we use that um, to benefit public good? And so there's lots of issues around that. And that issue is security issues, insurance issues. Um, what if, some, if we give someone a room and they destroy the room or there's coffee stains? There's, there's lots of things that had to be worked through in terms of government being okay with other organizations doing uh, and exploring how to, to use underutilized resources. Um, and, and so, uh, so uh, in the Netherlands, um, they've started testing with a specific NGO um, to, to explore how this, this could work um, and have now done a couple of meetings there and hope to, to potentially grow from a pilot into exploring how they could do this um, for, for NGOs that are trying to benefit uh, the population in Amsterdam even more. And then lastly, uh, it's really around access to justice. And so as we start talking about new technologies and we start talking about open data, the ability for access to justice actually rapidly increases. So access to justice is a big focus within OECD. Uh, it's a big focus within reforming the public sector where we are. It's a core uh, tenet of democracy itself and democracy in the Western world. Um, and so as information becomes more open, it's actually becoming more easy to, to have access to your justice system. And the example that we use here was actually from civil society uh, where there's a, a, a project called Clear My Records that was looking at people's records uh, that criminal records that had things on their record that was no longer illegal. And so by right, uh, in the case, this is specifically California, they could have those expunged from their criminal records. And that's really, really critical when it comes to employment, where uh, at least in the United States, you have to check if you've ever been convicted of a, a crime and actually list out what those are. And it can really infect your employment status and, and your uh, mobility um, within the economy. And so with these open records, uh, organizations could start helping people that should have these expunged recognize that they can be expunged and track these people down so that they have more social mobility and more chances in the economy. So all of this kind of sums up as we talk about increasing transparency, more data available to the public, that new technology allows us to explore new things and, and uh, open to new possibilities. And even the emergence of new business models becoming more popular uh, in our private lives, and so they leak into demand in the public sector, all of this wraps into the idea of open doors. And so I want to pass it over to Daniel now uh, to talk a little bit about the, the Indonesia um, circular economy as currency. Uh, just real quick, we did get one question in that kind of gets at exactly what Daniel's about to talk, uh, talk about. So uh, Alexander Metcalf uh, raised the question that uh, about what's could you please clarify the connection between what we meant when we said the circular economy as currency and, and what that kind of currency aspect is? Uh, and I think that the case study that Daniel's about to talk about should hopefully get us there. So with that, I'll pass it to Daniel to discuss uh, one of these cases. 
Thank you, Jamie. So um, one of the cases that really struck my interest this past um, call for innovations was what we've titled recyclables as transportation fee, uh, transportation fare. Um, started in the summer of 2018 uh, when Surabaya, which is the second largest city in Indonesia, uh, decided to launch a new initiative that would allow citizens to pay for their bus fare with recyclable bottles. Now, Indonesia, if you're unaware, is um, one of the largest producers of plastic waste in the world. They make 190 million tons of plastic waste, waste and yet their recycling rate is only 2%, which is on par with a lot of developing countries. Um, it, what ends up happening is about 3.2 metric tons of plastic waste end up in global waters coming out of Indonesia. And amongst uh, the most polluted rivers in the world, four of them come out of Indonesia, including the Sitaram River, which I don't know how to pronounce, uh, which is the world's worst uh, and most polluted river. Um, so there's definitely an interest to figure out a better way to handle their plastic bottles. Um, so what they did was the initiative launched by their very innovative mayor, Mayor Tree. Um, they got this bus program running um, where citizens, as I mentioned, could pay with their bottles. Um, the exchange rate for about two hours of travel is approximately three 1.5 liter bottles or uh, five 600 milliliter bottles. And I wasn't just using this as an example. Um, the, the residents can pay um, either on the bus with the person that's designated that will take it and put it in a bag and then give them a ticket or um, at an off-site location where they can exchange the bottles for uh, bus tickets. Each bus is able to take up to 250 kilograms of bottles a day. Uh, but the city has mentioned and has made an effort to make this clear that it's not about cutting a profit. It's not about uh, the Indonesian government benefiting from it. It's really an initiative that really has two prongs. Um, one prong is to reduce uh, waste, create more of a circular economy. And the second prong is to make transportation more accessible um, and make the citizens who might not have you know, economic means to still be able to take the bus through their plastics. So I think in a certain sense that what touches on um, Alex, uh, Alex's question earlier about, you know, what are the new currencies that we're seeing that are opening doors, uh, creating a more circular economy as well. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, this is Jamie again, and I'm just going to talk to you a bit about the third trend that we saw called machine readable world. But I did want to mention one thing uh, based on the different question we received about. Uh, so all of the workshop materials uh, not works on the show, sorry. Webinar materials will be available for download after the webinar, so we'll make sure you have all those so you don't have to um, be like jotting down any of the links or anything this second, and we'll be sure to provide those. Uh, and our third trend is we, we call machine readable world. Uh, and I think that this is, it, 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 like the previous trends, it encompasses a couple different subtrends. And uh, I think this, in some ways, is an interesting reflection of like where governments have been recently and then where we're going in the future. Uh, in terms of recently, governments have put a ton of efforts and, and there's been global initiatives to opening up government data and providing it as a fuel for uh, innovation and entrepreneurship and economic development through the new, new businesses and apps. Um, and governments have learned a tremendous amount about the power of publishing data as machine readable products and how people are able to take these machine readable things, plug them right into uh, new technologies and, and create new services with them. A lot of the apps that we use today, for example, are built on government data. For, uh, I think the most powerful ones are pretty much all weather data that we receive or what we read today, uh, or all GPS information that we use through our apps and all the geolocated features are all based on government data coming from uh, government funded satellites. Uh, so, we're seeing governments have a lot of experience with machine readability there, but then we're also seeing a tremendous growth in governments being interested in the emerging technologies like blockchain and AI uh, and, and all of these buzzwords that they're hearing about wondering how they can get involved. And we're seeing a bit of a, a marriage of these two things in a way where governments are starting to uh, look to the future, to these different kinds of emerging technologies. Um, maybe test them out or try piloting them or even just do feasibility studies and then realize like, wait a minute, like we're not there. We're lacking some fundamental necessities that we need uh, to be able to pursue these advanced technologies. But some of the lessons learned can come back, come uh, that we learned when we were started to do the open data push and we started to learn about um, how uh, building APIs for these sorts of things. We need to build double down on those types of efforts to build the platforms and to build the foundations necessary to get us to the next step. Um, so we're seeing 
governments and government partners putting a lot of effort into kind of taking all of the different inputs that they have and all of the different um, kind of methods of disseminating information that they have and reformatting them in ways that are machine readable and machine consumable so they can feed into algorithms that can feed into emerging technologies like AI uh, and, and, and building the kind of the, the, the structures necessary to enable the future. Um, so one example there that, uh, that Daniel will talk a little bit about is, is called uh, Better Rules. And it's a really fantastic case study that we see coming out of uh, New Zealand where they're converting laws and policies and different types of rules into machine readable formats that can then trigger automatic changes in, in things that implement those laws and make sure that the intent of those laws matches the way it's implemented. Um, we're seeing a lot of government actions into taking their surroundings in a geographical perspective and, and being able to convert those things into machine readable and machine consumable code uh, for new ways. So the example we have in the report is um, machine learning for land mapping in Queensland, Australia, where they're converting uh, all of these, uh, taking a manual process that used to involve surveyors working for years on understanding the way different land features and how that might react into disaster management response, for example, or just uh, land use and development. And uh, using satellite imagery and machine learning to uh, to propagate all of the different kind of uses for that and making all of the different land features machine readable and consumable that can be fed into different technologies. Um, and then when we get to, once we have certain kind of foundations and products in place, moving into actual testing out of emerging technologies. Um, so what we're seeing is uh, initial pilots in several countries for um, really kind of mission driven uh, uh, projects to try to solve big problems. And the case study we feature in the report here is actually a combination of, of blockchain and an, of AI as a test in Mongolia to see if the pairing of those two solutions could um, help to remedy a major issue that that country has with counterfeit medicines, where right now in Mongolia, 40% of all medicines are fake and it leads to uh, thousands of uh, injuries per year, thousands of deaths per year. Um, and they're trying to see if you can combine these new technologies and make a machine readable um, and immutable like course of uh, every transaction and every change of hands all that medicine has had and make sure you are able to detect with AI when, when something has uh, entered, the, uh, entered the workflow uh, that shouldn't be there or if there's a, like anomalous readings that you're able to kind of catch those things before they get out to the public. Um, and then I think that's also really big here, and it touches a little bit on uh, another question we got about what, what's the government role in, in, in these things. Um, and that's still, that's something we're talking about all the time here. Um, one of the things that we know uh, governments need to really focus on, as we discussed in the report, is all of the different ethical considerations that go into these. We've been thinking a lot of time about ethics and a bit of an observation that when a lot of governments are trying out these approaches, they're not necessarily talking about ethics and ensuring the approach has a lot of uh, ethical considerations behind it. Um, an example of, of like a really incredibly innovative use of kind of um, making things machine readable, but also incredibly controversial, uh, for example, is the way China is rolling out their social credit system, where basically like, almost every like, human decision and, and sometimes characteristic uh, is being fed, is being, um, converted into data and being fed into algorithms that generate social credit scores for all of the individuals and different decisions you make on a day-to-day -day basis go into increasing that score or decreasing that score and then they're having real world implications there. But like all of these different approaches are, 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 are is there an ethical lens being thought about? Are there ethical frameworks that uh, governments can think about uh, in terms of ensuring that they have a positive role in, in pursuing emerging technologies need to be considered. Um, so we also cover some models for considering ethics through the life cycle of initiatives like this. Um, and when it comes to the government's role, uh, as we received from the question, it's really tough to say. Um, we know that say, for example, we wrote a, block, a blockchain primer uh, a couple of months ago or last summer, where we tried to tease out some of the roles of government uh, with emerging technologies and um, there's certainly a lot of different types of roles, and I don't think we know exactly what the role will be, but we try to entertain some possible theories. Like when we talk about blockchain, it, does the government's role shift from providing these actual services to being a place that provides safeguards and assurances that, that decentralized systems are going to be able to um, achieve things in an effective and ethical way that can uh, 
minimize any negative effects. So while I don't think we have like a solid answer on how will the government's role change based on emerging technology, uh, I, I think that we, in, our, in this report and in some of the other reports that we're putting out, um, we, we discuss those ideas. Um, and just as a, a flag, in case you're interested, we did put out a blockchain primer a few months ago, but we're working on a primer for uh, the, use of, uh, the use and implications of uh, AI in public services. And we're currently open for, to ideas on, on what you think would be most important to include there. Um, our contact information is at the end of our slide. So if you have thoughts on what you think would be important for a government um, kind of basic guide on AI and a decision model, uh, we'd love to hear from you on that. Um, but with that, I want to give it to Daniel for a few moments to talk about um, one of the case studies that we think was most intriguing in this area. It's a little difficult, uh, very complex, but its ramifications could be huge and replicable. Thank you, Jamie. And while, uh, while I'm describing it, feel free to chime in if you have any ideas about the trends that you are observing in your own work. Uh, we're always happy to hear about um, the perception of different innovators from around the globe. Um, speaking of around the globe, on the other side of the globe in New Zealand, um, a fascinating case about trying to make legislation be machine readable. So um, the idea is to make sure that the law as it is drafted and then as it is implemented matches the original intent. Um, and not only in is New Zealand, but around the world, uh, legislation has a problem. Policy analysts and the drafters write the legislation so that it can be read by humans. And humans, we are imperfect beings. So, uh, and the drafters themselves are imperfect. So the, the, there's flaws on both sides. The legislation might have inconsistent definitions. Uh, they might be hard to interpret. Um, and then once there's an error that's been noticed, it might be hard to make changes. Uh, but then after the law is produced, then uh, troublesome lawyers like myself um, then you know, decide to interpret or translate a law as they see fit. So what New Zealand really did is uh, they turned the tables and decided to make machine uh, readable legislation. Um, what it does is they work with software developers who then translate these different rules into code using programmatic terms that can be clear and precise using the same definitions um, describing clearly the intent of the, uh, of the legislator um, and then with the re uh, result that it can have an instantaneous application that computers can see how a rule is set to apply and then apply it across the board. Um, they use this with two different case studies. They applied it to the Rates Rebate Act, which was an act that was already existent in New Zealand that was troublesome because it was um, designed to lower costs for people that are, uh, the cost of owning a home for people on low incomes, but it was hard to read and hard to interpret. Um, so that act really needed uh, to become machine readable. Uh, the other one being the Holidays Act, um, which is, was enacted to grant uh, employees in New, York, in New Zealand a guaranteed four weeks a, a year of holiday. Um, now, as a result of it, uh, we were able to shorten the feedback loops between the legislative intent and implementation to be in real time. Um, and it gives a clear authoritative source on what was the legislation. In America, we saw the ACA, the um, Obamacare, was Affordable Care Act, Affordable Care Act thank you, uh, <laughs> is still getting legislated. You know, people are still determined, not just legislated, uh, litigated. People are still determining what its intent was and whether or not it could correspond to the Constitution. Uh, us uh, going towards machine readable legislation could be a step towards reducing those ambiguities after the law has been put into place. Uh, what it also does is for technology that doesn't exist yet. So we're seeing applications for artificial intelligence happen everywhere. Last week on Google, you could um, pick a couple notes and then it would create Bach music that, as if Johann Sebastian Bach had made music himself you know, based off of the different data points from different Bach songs. This is the first two points in uh, legislation as code that then, you know, could computers make different legislation in the future? Well, now they've got a couple data points to start working with. And if it goes further, we'll see how, uh, how computers can do as legislators. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and uh, the report that we uh, wrote also contains a number of different recommendations uh, on, based on the success factors we saw from these cases as a whole that we observed um, that are, are available for folks to check out. And so us at the OECD team, uh, we're, we're uh, really enjoy the analysis. We really enjoy writing the reports and, and we spend a lot of our time on that. We, so far we've talked a lot about the report we put out, 
But all of this really culminates as well in a really fantastic event uh, that our partners at the uh, Center for Government Innovation in the UAE uh, go through painstaking efforts to turn these cases into immersive experiences. So they, an innovation project, an innovative, excuse me, innovation project becomes an immersive experience at this event every February. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to uh, our partner, Nora, who's going to describe how these types of cases culminate in this event and the work that we do uh, uh, with her and her team. All right. Um, and Nora, so and we're, we're on your slides now. Excuse me? Uh, we, we can I hear you and we're, we're on your slides. Oh. No. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so just to, to build on what uh, the uh, Opti team just said um, and on the work that is the extensive work that's being made for the Global Trends Report, uh, on the sidelines of that, we have the Edge of Government uh, Experience, which, we, which is part of the World Government Summit. And for this, um, we take a parallel path with the Opti team on this. And what we do here is we select a bunch of case studies and we build an experience around it. Um, so we, it's not your typical exhibition where we just put a kiosk and a roll up and uh, invite people to come. It's more of an immersive experience where people can actually engage with the case study and uh, actually um, go through the process of the case study. So for example, the team talked about the Carrot Rewards uh, project, which we featured in the uh, Edge of Government experience. What we did was we actually built the uh, application and people walked around and we were able to calculate the steps that they, uh, that they took and um, in return gave them a few points that they could um, hypothetically redeem for um, a loyalty program. Um, so just uh, so moving to the next slide, the Powered by You. Every year we have a theme um, in the edge of government and uh, this year's theme was called Powered by You. The idea behind the theme is that every initiative, every local event, um, every decision a person or a civil servant takes is all, push, um, everything is cultivated towards innovation. So whatever solutions you, can, you come up with, whatever initiative you do, it all powers up innovation within a person, within an entity, within a country. And this was the overall theme in the edge of government, um, which we designed a beautiful light installation also to, um, to reflect this uh, theme. Um, to the next slide, we also, um, in addition to the trends identified in the Global Trends Report, we also had a few uh, themes um, in the uh, edge of government just to be able to differentiate between the case studies. Um, for example, starting with Empower the Refugee uh, theme, we have two case studies here. Um, uh, one was from Switzerland and one was from Germany. And the idea here is to um, show people that we can, what would happen if we were able to empower the refugee and integrate them within society instead of seeing them as the uh, hurdle uh, on society. The next theme, um, or the next slide, is uh, Meet Your Digital Twin. And in this um, theme, we had a case study from Finland. It's called Aurora, uh, where uh, the idea of the project was to be able to uh, design your digital twin that would help you, uh, that would help you make decisions um, regarding your work, regarding your life, regarding your, your health, and it's all based on your data um, um, that you can upload to the uh, system. So it's like having your own digital mentor, but for, this, uh, for the purpose of the edge of government, we call this a digital twin. Uh, the next slide is um, for the theme, Activate Your Mind. And this is um, more about the uh, Canadian uh, project that the team talked about earlier, the character Awards. So I want um, to, so I want to speak about that uh, again, just to, or just to save some time. Um, and the, um, the one after that, the theme, Hack Your City Routine. Uh, this was an interesting theme um, where we had around four case studies featured under this um, overarching theme where we showed how a person can typically hack their city. It started with a case study from Netherlands where through a phone app, the elderly or people with special needs, they're able to hack a, a traffic uh, light in order to um, increase the seconds for them to cross the road. And then um, the same um, theme as well, we had a case study from Pakistan 
where they use or they will be using um, biofuel made out of cow manure to, um, to replace the uh, gasoline. And then we also had a case study from, um, from Indonesia where people, uh, where we introduced a new currency, and the team also talked about this case study in the report, where people, in the, where the Indonesian government introduced plastic as a new currency, and people are able to uh, access a bus or ride a bus while using, um, for example, five, uh, while recycling five bottles of uh, water, for example. And that would give them around two hours, um, a two hour ride in the city. And the last one was, uh, the last case study um, in this team is from, was from Singapore, where um, through artificial intelligence, uh, the, the Singaporean government is able to predict if, a, if the bus driver would go into an accident in three months time. And this goes to the different machine learning techniques and the algorithms they're using to study the behavior of the driver. Um, the last theme is um, hypercharger harvest. And this is a project from China where uh, they're using electricity in order to grow a more organic plants uh, and to reduce the use of pesticides used in, um, in, uh, in planting. Um, and then uh, the next slide comes from the um, Edge of Government Award, which was awarded to the Canadian government, uh, I mean, the Canadian case study, the Carrot Awards. And we had His Excellency um, Al Khail Guria and His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE, to, um, to award the winners during the World Government Summit. Um, the last slide I have is. Um, you have the uh, you can see the edge of government um, website where you you will be able to download the brochure about the world government about the edge of government read more about the case studies that i briefly mentioned and also on the website you will be able to download the um, global innovation trends report and yeah that's it fantastic thank you nora uh so no with that and we Thank you. We, we gave you a lot of information as a big, bit of an overview of, of what, we've, what we found over the last year uh, in hopes that you might engage with it more and, and visit our website and visit the Edge of Government website. Uh, and, but we also want to make sure that we have, are answering any questions that you might have. Uh, so we'd love to have a little bit of time for some Q&A before we wrap up. So if you have any additional questions, we can answer those if you pop them into the chat. I don't think it's possible to just unmute folks, unfortunately, because it becomes a very manual process on our end, but we will certainly read whatever you mention. And in addition to questions, um, we're always looking for the insights uh, of folks in government to understand your perceptions of what do you see as being next? What are, what are the emerging trends that you think are happening in your government or that you're seeing in other governments? Because uh, a lot of those go into, uh, we, we figure out these trends by talking to folks like, uh, like the attendees of this webinar. Um, so your, your thoughts are, are very valuable to us. So any questions or thoughts on emerging trends? So one thing I want to add to the, the conversation around the mm -hmm. definition of role and public value mm -hmm. in creating emerging, uh, around emerging technologies that, that we, we talk about beyond um, the, the things that Jamie had mentioned and specifically the role of government around um, how emerging technologies form and that each government has a very uh, different take into um, their role into private industry as emerging technologies turn into emerging markets, which turned into business as usual. Um, we don't take a stance on that in terms of the government's roles around uh, regulation. Um, but we do uh, take a, a stance that regardless if the government is going to regulate things, uh, the gov government as a whole needs to be more engaged with some of these uh, emerging technologies when they're still nascent um, to better understand them and understand their potential impact um, to make a more educated decision. Uh, and so this gets a lot into the conversations that are happening right now in a lot of Western democracies around Facebook, around Twitter. Um, and instead of once something becomes really bad, having the public sector start looking at it and analyzing it, could the public sector have been engaged earlier in some capacity? 
would that have helped? Um, it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, but the, the point is, it's very hard for the government to take any sort of stance and make any sort of educated decision um, without having some sort of engagement and understanding of the technologies. And that also gets into when the government is procuring them, um, when it's developing requirements for them. The more information and more experience that the government has, uh, that's more hands-on actual experiential knowledge um, rather than just um, reading reports and educational material, I think the, the better the decisions can be. So we just got another question uh, about wondering whether you have an overview of the factors that don't only induce, but also lead to failure of implementing innovations in the public sector. I think Kevin and I both have some, some thoughts on that, but first I think I'd preface it to say that um, I think we think less here about what are factors that lead to failure and we think more about what are the factors you need to have a success? Uh, and, and then by, by extension, I think it's like a, a lack of those factors that probably leads to the failures. But we like to focus on what, can, what, what are the positive factors and success factors that can help improve your chances. Uh, and then we like try to build our portfolio of, of, of what we provide governments um, around those success factors. I think some of the key ones are, um, you know, uh, not reinventing the wheel. We see a lot of governments that spend a tremendous amount of time um, trying to duplicate or replicate, or no, excuse me, uh, that's a, uh, trying to create from scratch something that's already been done elsewhere when they could potentially duplicate or replicate uh, something that's already been done. Um, and sometimes those things that have already been done include uh, failures along the way that have led to successes and that, that could be learned from where someone who's potentially not exploring beyond their own borders, for example, might not might not see that someone else has already played out the same scenario that they're already thinking of doing and maybe there's some some a different way to approach it or a better way or or it's just something to look out for so i think being uh curious and exploratory is important there um ensuring that the kind of decisions and the the thoughts that go into a process and have a, a really diverse point of views that go into it um, I, I know a, a lot of my government experience or in working with governments, a lot of times you have a lot of brilliant, brilliant people in the room that are working on a project and, and they think that they'll have all the answers, but then you spend a lot of time working on an innovation project, you're all really behind it and excited about it. But then when you, when, when you kind of launch it or you put it out, uh, it, it doesn't really meet the needs of a lot of people. Or maybe there were some misassumptions that you had in the process of building that um, that, that you could have picked up fairly easily early in the process by sure, ensuring a lot of different diverse uh, views, maybe from outside of the room of really smart people uh, are, are really considered in there. Um, I think another huge one uh, we talk a bit about in the, the machine readable world section is um, multidisciplinary, like supporting multidisciplinary approaches. Like the, the better rules case, for example, uh, had uh, brought together policy analysts and lawyers and um, people that work from like legislative staff and uh, designers and uh, coders to all come together and stare at a problem from many different perspectives to figure out the best solution uh, where uh, and that multidisciplinary approach is incredibly important for that project and for many of the other projects we see like you need to think about who are the who are the who are the people on the periphery that uh, have in, in, like have equities in, in how something unfolds. Um, and a, another one is, is, as touched on earlier, is just building ethics into every step of the process. You don't have to add many, many layers of bureaucracy. You might just be able to like set up a point where everybody gets together and asks themselves a few key questions uh, uh, about whether the, all of the considerations and uh, ethical approaches have been built into something from scratch instead of releasing something and, and, and then it becoming a big scandal if there's something done not properly or some uh, ill-intended uh, uh, consequences. And in the report, in the, in the Machine Road Over World especially, we, we provide a really great ethical framework that um, colleagues uh, at the Beck Center uh, in, in George, I think it was Georgetown, George, George. Georgetown University have come up with, which is something that we, questions we ask ourselves when we're doing projects now. Uh, and Kevin, I know you tackled some specific success factors <laughs> in yours as well. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll back up and talk a little bit about theory and approaches. Um, so in general, part of the, what we see around successes for, for implementation um, 
I'd say part of it is around are people framing the problem correctly? Oftentimes in the public sector, we don't have the ability to frame a problem. We are given the problem without any time to review that and then are supposed to implement a predetermined solution, uh, which generally doesn't turn out very successful or oftentimes does not. So having that methodology where you are continuously uh, questioning your assumptions, going back and challenging your hypothesis and testing them um, rather than just saying the problem we have is framed, it is static, and therefore we can just move forward. And on the other side of that, uh, when you talk about implementation, if you have the problem framed correctly, um, are you doing it in a way that allows you to test and succeed? So one of the biggest challenges uh, that when we see failures in public sector innovation, generally the failures that you hear about are the really, really bad failures. The failures with huge cost overruns, um, that, that a system that delivered to fail on its, its promises, uh, specifically usually around technology. Um, so the thought of if you're truly doing something innovative, you don't know the actual results. And if you don't know the results, how do you mitigate that risk? And a lot of the patterns that we see of that mitigation is around iteration and doing things in chunks rather than trying to tackle it all at once. And then taking a step back, assessing your results, learning something and deciding what that next step is rather than having a predetermined Gantt chart that explains exactly what every step is for the next five years. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot in the report that relates to this is, are you using the right approaches and methodologies for the right problems? So if you go through the trends report, there is um, a diamond that you will see over and over again. And this diamond is our facets model around what type of innovation you are doing and kind of what is your ambition. And um, it's around, is it top down? Is it bottom up innovation? Does it have high uncertainty, low uncertainty? And it starts trying to link uh, some of the methods and tools that you should be using for them. And oftentimes for, for innovations that we see disappoint, even when they frame the problem correctly, is they did not use the appropriate methodology. They did not use the appropriate um, tools to actually succeed with the innovation they were trying to achieve. And so in many of these case studies, we actually match many of the, the facets uh, that we have developed for innovation into the cases so as to, to better understand how those things link. Uh, and just before we wrap up, uh, Helen has sent a few questions in, uh, and I, I don't know if I'll be able to get to it fully because we're at time, but it, it, it's about how uh, getting together with a lot of different innovators or people uh, working on different projects uh, that may or may not be innovative, innovative often discovered that they, we all have the same complex questions that we're asking, and we all have the same challenges and what kind of vehicles exist for governments to help explore global challenges together. Um, well, I, th I think that you're kind of uh, being part of it in a way right now, where, 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 what solutions can we provide? Well, we're trying to build a network of innovators who can co like connect and collaborate um, and, and help learn from each other. Uh, and that's the purpose of this work and that's the purpose of our team here. Um, and, and as a way to inform you about some of the, the ways we're doing that, and uh, increasingly so, is if you, so say for example, if you go to our website right now, you can re read case studies on pretty much all of the cases that we've talked about today. Um, if you register and become a registered user of it, you can actually see who submitted these case studies and you can click on their name and read their profile and send them a, a message directly. Um, so we're trying to rat, like, connect people behind similar ideas and similar concepts to try to be able to like, get these ideas spreading by um, us providing you enough information where you know something interesting and you want to learn more and then providing you a conduit into somebody who's done it or somebody that you can work with and, and, and try to tackle these complex questions together. Um, it's not too good right now, but we're working on enhancing it. But like the, 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 there's also the community aspect of our website where we're trying to build discussion forums and discussion groups. Um, and we have some enhancements planned for that because it's not as user friendly as we want it to be right now. Um, and then we're also trying to keep people from reinventing the wheel by providing you with other different tools and resources you can provide. So I just mentioned the case study database, the community platform. We also have a toolkit navigator on our website that has hundreds of different tools and toolkits broken down by different classifications or different objectives or goals you're trying to achieve and tools that are already available, often open source that you can use and adapt to apply those things. And that's taking somebody else's learning and then directly applying it to your own uh, uh, 
context with as little as little work as possible. So I think these are all things that we're trying to do to work collectively with uh, everybody here and everybody, all the folks on the line and everybody who's part of our community to try to tackle these uh, tough problems together. Uh, and these are the vehicles that we think can help do that. But uh, if you have any additional ideas, uh, we would really love to hear them. Every product that we build and all the stuff that we do, we try to do from an, a, 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 like an external demand point of view. Like where we came up with the toolkit because we met with a lot of people uh, and they said they needed to understand what tools and resources exist. Same thing with what's going on in the world. So, but um, our current slide has our contact information as well as the contact information from, uh, from Nora, as well as some important links to the digital story for this report, our website and the um, uh, Mohammed bin Rashid Center for Government Innovation website as well. Um, and we'd love if you connect with us on there. Uh, we also have a newsletter that we put out every two weeks that gives you the latest information on what's going on in the community, um, but always looking for new ideas. Uh, so that's all I have. Anything from you, Kevin or Daniel? No. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, we hope to have more of these types of webinars going forward. Um, it's something that we continue to explore uh, growing, but any additional feedback we'd also appreciate. And we will um, provide these uh, slides and other materials uh, after the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.